Welcome to the Business Spotlight and Scale Her Up. Uh, I'm Brenda Hector and with me today I've got Sam Robson from the Temple Clinic in Aberdeen. Uh, welcome Sam, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you, thank you. So um, just to, as a start to the, the viewers and listeners, what does Temple Clinic do? Gosh, that's a very good question. Um, essentially, we started off as being a private medical clinic. Um, my background's in general practice. And what we do is we focus on how we can make a difference to people's lives in terms of slowing down the aging process, um, understanding the aging process. It might be using injectable treatments. Um, it definitely will involve looking at your skin. Um, a lot of a lot of what I love doing is teaching people how to self-sufficiently slow down the aging process. So there's the injectable side, there's skin, there's problem skin. So I see a lot of people with acne and rosacea. Um, I have a weight management program that we've created, launched it really in, just before COVID called Temple V. Um, that's probably my biggest passion. Um, balance people's hormones. When you get to a certain age, you become much more focused on the mm -hmm. menopause and it seems very, it's very trending at the moment. Um, so I feel I'm in the right place at the right time with that. Um, and in lockdown, I did, uh, as everybody had time on their hands, I took another qualification in lifestyle medicine. And that really changed everything I do in the clinic that everything has got a lifestyle medicine orientation around it. So you're looking at the pill pillars of your lifestyle, diet, um, exercise, sleep, stress, social connections, substances, kind of like alcohol, smoking and other such things. And if you can optimize these, then your need for other medical intervention um, is much, much less. So um, with my weight management people, clearly they're more likely to keep the weight off, lose the weight and keep the weight off if they have a healthy lifestyle to, that supports that. Um, if people have got problem skin, yes, I can provide them with products and treatments. But if they understand how their own lifestyle is impacting on their skin, then it's it, you know they're going to get much better results. Um, if I'm looking at balancing somebody's hormones, then if somebody burns a candle at both ends, doesn't get enough sleep, drinks too much alcohol, is stressed, doesn't have a supportive network around them and their diet is really poor and they don't get any kind of exercise at all. And with that, just any kind of physical activity, it's unlikely that just supplying them with hormones is going to change all of that. So it's it's trying to get everything into a kind of a context of we work together to help people live as healthy a life as possible. And then the treatments that we offer are kind of almost like the icing on the cake. And if that explains it. Oh my goodness, you've got me, you've got me all excited as um, I had trouble with acne all of my adult life until I hit menopause and that's okay. the only positive there, there's been. Okay. Now, recently turned 50, I'm um, thinking about all of these things, but that's not why we're on here. We're not here to talk about my um, health challenges, that might be for another conversation. We're here to talk about your journey as a business owner okay. and, um, and how you, so you said, Formerly a, a GP, a GP. Is that right? yeah. yes. yes. So I qualified in Aberdeen in 1991 and I qualified as a GP in 1997. Um, was working as a part time GP um, whilst I had a young family and they've now grown up. Um, and then I fell into aesthetics completely unexpectedly and by accident I mean it, it there's a lot to be said for when an opportunity presents itself it's only a good opportunity if you do something useful with it and I had this opportunity um went on a basic training course and thought oh this is really interesting um didn't at that point in time this that was back in 2004 didn't think it was necessarily something that I would engage with in terms of, you know, Botox and fillers. I thought, well, I don't need it was kind of was my feeling. Um, but the following year when my youngest son turned five and said, mommy, why have you got all those cracks in your face? I thought, mm, maybe it's time. <laughs> and it, it's funny, actually, I share, I share that kind of 
story with my patients and so many of them identify with it you know children can be brutally ruthless and tell it as it is um so yes so then 2005 I started having treatments and and I very much value the kind of the not looking like you've had lots of treatments look yes so yeah next year is my biggie where I will be turning 60 and I'm thinking oh my god the best thing about that's going to be getting that bus pass <laughs> but yeah I, I guess there therefore you understand your 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 customer and and is there I guess there are a lot of um misconceptions maybe or assumptions made about what you do and are, is there a the either side of the fence I would never do that or I, I disagree with that or I'm having everything that you can everything um, I can afford. It's interesting, you know, people have a perception about the aesthetic industry and probably in, in many, many respects, quite rightly so. Um, I think it should be done safely. I think it should be done in an appropriate premises. I think people should be properly regulated. I think people should carry insurance. Um, it's one of my biggest bugbears is that anyone can go on a course and it's legal. Um, it astounds me. Um, it really does it astounds me that that it is legal and it astounds me that people would say well but you're so much more expensive than the air steward up the road and I think yeah but it's your face and that you know there have been occasions when I when I've been about to treat somebody and I've been asking them some details about their medical history and they said I, there was one particular lady who said um oh god I keep forgetting you're a doctor and I said well why would you let me inject anything into your face if I wasn't a doctor and she, was, she sort of, oh, yeah, but hairdressers and that could do it. I said, would you let your hairdresser give you a travel vaccine? Because that's actually much, much safer and much less risky. And and she was horrified at the thought that that, that that could happen. But there is a perception that aesthetics is just a step further in the beauty industry. And it's it's absolutely not. Fascinating. Fascinating. So, um Over the, over the years, then building your building your business, what have been what have you learned on that journey? Gosh, I probably would take way longer than your podcast to tell you. Um, big things I've learned. I think follow your heart. You know, if it feels right, it probably is right. Um, the reverse true. If it feels that it's not right don't do it if it feels like it's not right don't do it um but I think trusting your instincts is a big thing and I think be prepared to stand by what you do you um I love what I do I, I I'm I feel very privileged to have a job that I'm so passionate about and I know my patients benefit from that because I invest in every one of them and um and I think I think that inspires confidence you know that people know I'm taking care of them and I they know I will give them good advice um I suppose you said what else have I learned um don't think you can do everything so I know what my limits are I think the longer I've been a doctor the more I've become aware of what I don't know and I know when I when I first qualified you kind of feel invincible and like you know everything and then you spend the next but how many years that's how many years since I qualified 91 my maths is not my strength 30 33 years this year um the longer I'm in medicine the more I realize I don't know and I think that makes me safe because I know what I don't know and then I refer on to people who have more expertise but it's the same within the business I mean from a medical point of view that's quite easy you know you I wouldn't be looking at doing surgical procedures I would refer to a really top class surgeon and the recommendations I make are ones that I personally would use that person myself as well. So I I think, yeah, I think knowing what I don't know, and that applies, you know, I, I have out, outsourced accountants. Um, I've outsourced my um, digital media um, or digital marketing. You know, I, I think getting the right tribe of people around you is critical. And if they share your values and the passion, then that's 
I've, I feel very fortunate with that. You know, I have a, I have a fantastic team and without them, I don't think I would be able to do as much as I can or as I, as I do. So are you, are you very clear on your, on your values then and outsourcing even to your accountant? Does that need to be somebody that sort of fits your they have to get what the industry is about. Um, I think that's really important because, you know, every every industry is unique and it has, you know, with, with the accounting side of things, okay, you have to be compliant with um, submitting your accounts on time and all these kind of things, but you also need an accountant to actually understand um, understand all the finances of the business. And if to understand all the finances of the business, I think the accountant needs to understand the business. And the you know what the, the actual content of the business. Um, I think that's important. You, I think you get more out of the people you work with if they are on the same page as you. Absolutely, I totally agree. Yes, yes. And um, is it? But how big how big a team do you have, or do you have a, a number of? I don't I've know. I've got. What, oh, oh, I, I, think, I think there's eight of us at the moment. I mean, as I said, I out the accountant is. You know, the accountant um, is, if I said to, that I'm not counting them in that team, the actual people within the clinic would be people, things like my clinic manager, who is invaluable. Um, I have people on front of house, the kind of reception girls. I have three therapists and uh, an in-house financial, um, what would I call her? She's, um, She's our finance admin stock person. We all have to multitask because we're quite a small team. But um, I'm confident that all the people that are in my team are um, know what we're about. So tell me, tell me about the challenges of building a good performing team. Then I think you have to kiss a lot of frogs, and I think I think you could you know. I don't think it matters if if you if you have people that are really good on your team, you want to hang on to them. And if people move on, it's almost like a a mutually agreed situation that it's it's like dating in some respects, if you know what I mean. You know, if if it doesn't work, then you need to part company. Um I think what was your question again? What's how do you build a good team? Um I don't know how you, I, I, I kind of think I, we probably do it by accident rather than, it's not like a, a clear program. I think we've evolved when we take new people on, there's a much clearer induction procedure and everybody's on probation and everybody knows, if I said the hierarchy, we're not a hierarchical place to work, but everybody knows who they're immediately accountable to. Um, and I think knowing what's expected from them and you know we we conduct appraisals on an annual basis and and that's really good because it gives although people have a voice all the time they have a very clear opportunity at their appraisal to reflect on what's going well what do they need to make their job better what would they like to make their job better and and they they're heard you know, we have regular meetings and um, my clinic manager does one-to-ones with everyone sort of on a roughly six weekly basis. So we try and pick up issues before they become issues. Oh, it sounds like you've got a good structure there to make that happen. But that's, that, Brenda, that's evolved over time. You know, it, I think it's, when it started off, it was just me. And it's sort of recognising that having a good clinic manager removes the responsibility of me trying to be a clinic manager because I'm not a clinic manager. You know, first and foremost, I'm a doctor. And you, unless you've had training in management and you have some expertise in management, then it's naive to think, oh, I can just do it. So I, I think what makes a good team? Probably recognizing people's strengths and playing to them. Um, doing things together as a team you know, we we all went down to the scottish aesthetic awards together and by golly gosh it was that was fun um and we have an annual barbecue at my house which is it's like what happens at the barbecue stays at the barbecue you know it's it's, it's i won't ask <laughs> no no don't ask because i wouldn't tell you you'd have to be there to see but it's 
it's it's ha making time to have fun together um good communication i think is very important um trying to think what other things i really love about my team um respect you know they know i respect them and i know they respect me and that goes a long way and i think there's just there's just a nice culture amongst the staff you know they're, they're a really nice group of people so i'm very lucky in that respect um yeah it's not a, luck's not a good word to use though when when you've just described all everything that you've been through and how it's evolved i think luck is when preparedness meets opportunity and you know it's finding the right people and you being ready for them to join your team and having the understanding of how to make that work i think yeah and they and, and they all you know and the thing is what we started doing which is quite was i think for some of the it's it's all girls that are in the team but you know it, it, maybe we're not allowed to say it's all girls but it's all girls um and all of varying ages you know i'm by far and away the oldest person the youngest person is 20 but she's 20 going on I, I forget that she's younger than my children um but we we started when we had clinic meetings we started rotating the chair so everybody has to chair the clinic meeting and that actually gets a lot more investment because suddenly they're responsible for chairing the meeting and, and some of them have never done anything like that before and the usual challenge is to stop me talking so that they can talk you know, and and everybody contributes to the agenda everyone and everyone contributes to the actual discussions that go on um we've also got we introduced a new thing called soup club in the winter and it's salad club in the in the summer and we all take it in turns that you know there's one day in the week when you provide food for everybody and that's actually has been a really good way of bringing us all together. You know, we, you love it when someone else is cooking your lunch and it's a big kind of, oh God, I'm on soup club tomorrow. What am I going to do? But that, I think that works. Oh, I love that. What a great idea. I've written that down. Soup club and salad club. Yeah. I love it. I mean, you, you've also got different people's idea of what makes a good salad or what makes a good soup. Yeah, I think you'll you'll learn what you like about a salad and what you don't. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and I think one of the things that, you know, everything I think everything we do in the clinic is um, of interest to everybody. But and that's maybe a kind of a a naive way. You know, I think we all we all believe very much in our own business. And I think I have something for everyone. Anyone who wanted to come in to see me, you know, um there's all people can always improve their skincare they can always improve their diet they it's it's kind of you know it's one of the reasons we called the place temple because I saw it as but you know when it was quite difficult choosing the name and thinking I thought it would be a place a kind of a a place where you learn a place where yeah a place of education place where it's safe yeah I like and and there's there's a connotation with with worship and I'm thinking that yeah that to appreciate what you've got in your yeah and your body's a temple yeah, you know you, yeah. your body's a temple your face is a temple and it's sort of you know um when, one of the reasons people I think are damning about the industry is they think oh it's so superficial and vain and I said we, well th that just sums up the human species I mean we judge people within three seconds we make a snap judgment of them based on what we see in front of us you know old past it angry whatever and most people who come in to see me if they're looking for an aesthetic treatment you know they're they're not usually coming and say oh I want bigger lips or I want these lines gone it's kind of it's much more emotive than that they they don't want to look in the mirror and, and see a sad person or a tired person looking back at them. And, you, you know, if you can help somebody feel more confident in their own skin, then it's like putting a light on behind a stained glass window and they just come alive and, and, and no one else will notice that they've had a bit of Botox or a bit of filler or, or I suppose weight is a very obvious one that people notice, but nobody notices. They just notice that that person is just happier and, more in, able to engage with them so able, able to enjoy their life more 
exactly that exactly that and if you feel better then you're always going to be happier you know if your diet's better you and, and when I say you know when you think diet we're not thinking starvation but thinking what you actually put into your body um one of the things I learned when I was doing my lifestyle medicine was all about the microbiome and I I must admit I'm a, a bit of a get me on a podium talking about the microbiome I love it and I really do think and believe that the microbiome is the conductor of the orchestra for all of our health issues. So if everything you do improves the health of your gut, then you're going to be better. So your gut has an influence on your skin and the bacteria in your gut have an influence on your immunity, on your mood, on your weight, on your appetite, on your sleep, on your, on everything. So if you just look after them, then they will look after you. It's, uh, probably sounds very simplistic but you know if you get enough sleep that has a positive effect on your gut microbiome if you eat the right kind of diet and it's funny because when I ask people say my my the people who come to my problem skin clinic and I say you, they provided a food diary so I can see what they're eating I said what do you think would be really good for your gut microbiome and make it really healthy everybody knows and it's astonishing you know they, they they know it's more fruit and vegetables and and yet I, it's a constant source of disappointment to me if I go out to dinner and it's like it's a side order of veg you think ah that should be the main thing you eat with a side order of your protein so so yeah there's a lot of it I, I know I'm probably rambling a bit now sorry um there's so much of what I do is about teaching people how to be more self-sufficient but at the same time for me every day is a school day I learn so much from the people that come in to see me do you know I, it's it's so relevant you know I, we came on here to talk about business and to talk about but actually I often say to my clients you know encouraging them to exercise healthy body healthy mind healthy business and just been been reflecting on. I listen a lot to um, Diary of a CEO. Oh yes, yes, with Stephen Bartlett. And actually, recently, there's much less talk of business and an awful lot of talk about um, health, physical and mental health. So um, yeah, it's it just it's. I think it's it's totally entwined. Actually, You're... well, without your health, you've got nothing. And, you know, I, I I think one of the things I've just been at a big aesthetics conference down in London and the move towards wellness and health. It's sort of, you know, it, it's I love it when I go and think, oh, yes, everybody is sort of they're all doing this or they're looking to do the same kind of thing that I believe in, which is, you know, if you if you balance your hormones, you get the lifestyle factors right, then everything else is better and they're happier. And, and at the end of the day, our job is surely to improve people's lives and health. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in your, well, you mentioned that you'd been, you've been to a conference and you've been to awards recently. Um, what are you most proud of in your business? Gosh, that's a really good question. What am I most proud of in my business? Um, I think that it, I'm, I'm proud yeah. that it, it excuse my dog retching in the background she's very disturbing Ugh. um I've got an old dog she's nearly oh. 15 so she she's noisy um what am I most proud of I think that I feel the business and everything we offer embodies everything that I believe in so that makes it easy to be passionate about it um that feels like a real privilege to be able to do something that I really really love doing That's oh, lovely. I'm just reflecting. Me too. Oh, yeah. oh fantastic. <laughs> so um the Scale Her Up was uh, my the podcast was born from uh, me reading the um the Rose review on female entrepreneurship. And okay. uh, only um one in three entrepreneurs in the UK is female. So there's twice as many men as are entrepreneurs. And men are five times more likely to scale their business up to over a million in turnover than a woman will. And it, if we did, it would add 250 billion to the UK economy. So, you know, that there's a massive opportunity to have a big difference. What can we do as women in business to encourage others to start and scale as well? 
I think encourage others to mm -hmm. to skate. You know, I I think encouragement is a big thing. Um, encouraging people to believe in themselves. You know, it, women are. I've rarely had a male patient come in and we will sit and have a consultation and discuss the various treatment options. And it's not often that a man will sit back and say, well, I can't justify that expense. You know, they, they need it. They want it. They do it. And women are kind of, oh, well, you know, I'd really like to, but, and they feel they have to justify, you know, they've got, they, I don't think women are very good at, putting their own needs first because that society conditions them to do that and I I don't think women well certainly when I was at school um I don't think women were encouraged to believe that they could be successful in their own right you know I, I remember I, I'm sure with hindsight and reflecting back I'm sure the doctor who was interviewing me when I applied to medical school was being provocative I certainly hope he was but he I was sort of, I came along, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed coming into medicine or hoping to get into medical school. And, and he says, said, he says, you know, in some respects, there's not really any point in training you up to be a doctor because you're just going to leave and have kids. And I was kind of like, I think he probably did just say it to be provocative. I mean, this was in the, in the um, early eighties, but it was this, there is this perception that that's a woman's role is to support their other half and to raise the kids and we put our careers on hold because that's what's expected from you and you even if you have I've seen it with my colleagues even if you have two doctors you, the, the woman still does most of the child care and most of the it's it's unusual to find a situation where the man does as much behind the scenes but it's also career opportunities and you know if you look at if you look in medicine um male doctors tend to earn more than female doctors i guess it's like every walk of life you know we've had to come off the career ladder to raise families so what could we do um i think more support with childcare would be massive yeah. you know um childcare good childcare is so expensive and you know, when I look amongst my staff who've all got young families, it's always them that has to pick up the 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 package of, you know, they carry the hot potato if the child's not well. So I think more childcare, um, affordable childcare, free childcare would give women more opportunities. And supporting women to return to business after they've had their family. I'm I'm absolutely loving the revolution that's going on um, with respect to the menopause, um, where people are talking about it, yeah. and you, and I I hear doctors saying, oh, you know, you're medicalizing the menopause by offering people HRT. Well, we've medicalized childbirth, and women aren't expected to drop a baby in a dark corner anymore. It's, it's part of life's experience. But you, know, if your thyroid gland stops working, no one says, well, it's just part of life. But when your ovaries stop working, which they do when you go through the menopause, and you know your your the hormones they produce the the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you those have an impact on every single part of your body and your health. And oh, you hear, I know it. <laughs> what's that? Don't I know it? <laughs> well, and it's and it just it should be it should be more routine that women are offered support. But it's also HRT is not. In, in my opinion, HRT is not just for the menopause. You know, you you need balanced hormones for your whole life. Um, after the menopause, you know, there's increasing evidence that women who are on appropriate HRT, they have less risk of dementia, less heart disease, less, what else? Bone disease. You can lower and mitigate the risks of some cancers. It's it's There are so many benefits to those hormones um and i we did a, a menopause event at the clinic very recently navigating the perimenopause um and i that was on the back of going to a menopause conference which was fascinating and realizing that there is so much that is impacted by going through the menopause you, your skin um, 
you know, two thirds of of postmenopausal women experience hair loss or hair thinning, and and for women that's a big thing. You know, your hair is your crowning glory. What can you do about it? So presenting and teaching people who came to the event about what they could do felt quite empowering that you knew you don't have to accept that there's nothing there are things you can do and yes of course come back to lifestyle you know, the the hormones by themselves um you you can help somebody manage the perimenopause and after the menopause so much better if they sleep and their diet and exercise and stress are all better but it's understanding that is the first step and then add in hormones which can have a very positive effect so yeah i'm 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 excited by the revolution there and one of the things i talked to the the women who attended about was why is it that we're in this situation and you know a little bit of it is down to the gender bias in medicine you know it's only been the past 100 years or so that women have actually been allowed to be doctors um, I think that's been part of it. Um, but another big part of it is there's not actually been a lot of research until recent years done on women. You know, most of the research, most of the things we've learned about medicine has been extrapolated from research done on men. And the reason, I think, is because women's hormone levels, once they start having periods, their their hormones change every month. And then add in the menopause and and it's such a difficult variable to control that it's easier not to do research on women. So Oops. now that they are doing more research on women, but it and you know, women present differently if they have a heart attack. They're they're kind of they so if you're looking for men's symptoms and a woman having a heart attack, you might miss it. Yeah. So it's changing. It's changing. I I believe that in 20 years time, offering women hormones to replace the hormones that their body used to make. So body identical, bioidentical, call it what you will, but hormones that are the same as their body produces. I think it will be commonplace, just like we give people thyroid hormones when their thyroid gland stops working. So, and, and the difference I see in people's lives it's astonishing, you know, they, they're they struggling to lose weight, you balance their hormones, oh, it all starts to work a bit better. You, it's, everything's interconnected. It's fascinating for me as a business coach as well, because I've got clients who are, you know, it makes running their business so much harder. And clients who, until myself included, not realizing until it came to a crisis point that actually, but it, it's the hormones yes. that are causing all of this, the, this um, stress and anxiety and, and the inability to function properly and, and to think. That, that having, a, having an impact on the customers, um, employees, the, the business as a whole, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's huge. I mean, you know, we, we probably both know successful women who just they're at the top of their game and suddenly you know you have all you need is one crippling hot flush during an important meeting and you lose your train of thought and suddenly your credibility plummets and everyone thinks oh she's lost it you know and then, and then they lose their confidence yes 100 percent. and you know people that that leave that you know take a take a less senior role or a less um a, a role that needs that requires less responsibility because they don't feel that they're up to it and yeah I think it's it but it's a whole culture around it you know and and, and I I think it's you know if, if if a man is assertive he's assertive and it's described positively uh, I mean I'm don't get me wrong I'm not anti-men I I just think women if you if you are an assertive woman you're strident and it's negative and it's it's I think I think the equality is coming in many respects, but I also think women can be quite bad about holding women down. You know, they kind of, they get above that glass ceiling and then they, they close it off behind them and they don't support women to get up there. And I don't really understand what that's about. So I think what you're saying is that there's a cult, there's a, 
there's a culture change coming through mm. everywhere and I'm just thinking about my my daughters at uh, um, 16 and 19 you know they've got very different attitudes to to what we grew up through so I, I think that change is coming um oh but, exactly no but I, I think I see all my sons to help as well I mean my my sons are 23 and 26 and they just astonish me with the their level of maturity and sensitivity and they kind of you know they make me feel sometimes that god you know mom you know times have changed and it's sort of you know my my elder son is he 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 said very recently I spoke to him on his birthday and he said I mean I was asking um what his plans or what was up to what was going on in his life and he said he he is constantly on this journey of self-improvement which didn't occur to me when I was 26 to be on that journey and you know he says he says I've decided mom one of my new things is every day I say to myself what can I do to make my tomorrow self happier and I was kind of like oh my god Mm -hmm. wow I'm going to do that. And it, it's sort of, you know, but it's the wisdom that they have and the self-awareness that they have. You know, I think God, we kind of drifted. You know what I mean? We we just, things happened and we reacted. And yet I see them both better with their planning and, you know, they've managed to survive social media. God, thank goodness that wasn't around when I was a teenager. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you what would you say? I'm going to make this my last question. I okay, sorry. So yes. I've... What would you you've you've led on to it yourself. Um what would you say to an 18-year-old Sam if you could go back and give her oh, some gosh. Advice? I would say follow your heart and believe in your dreams and um set yourself a goal and achieve it. You know, don't don't believe you can't do it because I think I think that's one of the things that you, that can be quite you can be limited by your your own fears mm. and your lack of imagination um be kind you know remember the people you know it's almost like the people who people rem- people never forget how you make them feel so oh, these these are all things i think i would say um that brings you back beautifully to your business actually that it's all about making people feel better and people yeah. Get how you make them feel. Yeah, exactly, and and exactly, and and I think, and you your tribe will find you. You know, you find your tribe, but they will find you. And I think, I think unintentionally, we all do this. I'm sure it's the same with you that you somehow you find yourself drawn to and drawing people who share your values. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I I feel very very fortunate to love my job, and you know I have a great team and. I value them and I think they feel valued. So yeah, I I don't know. I'd say a lot of things to that 18 year old me. I'd probably sit down and give me a big talking to about stick in there. Don't give up, Um, do the homework. Don't leave it till the last minute. I've never been very good at that. Um, I'm a great procrastinator and that's um, not a good thing. Well, you're aware of it now probably oh, well I'm aware of it but that doesn't stop me being a procrastinator but it, yeah yeah I think it's, don't sweat the small stuff you know it's lots of things um Sam it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the business spotlight and skill her up um thank you very much for your time and um for sharing your what you're obviously very passionate about um, thank you so much it's a pleasure to hear someone talk about their business with the enthusiasm that you've had Thank no, you thank, you. thank you very much for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I hope to see you again.